Ja, nou, ik laat ik ze er toch maar even opzetten. Want ik weet hoe het gaat. Dan, dan, we hebben het niet meer. En uh, de kaasmodel. De seksmodel. Jingstai. But it seems that the, the time is going faster according to. That's right. It goes faster. But even the Hindus said that in their cyclical idea that the yeah. ages. But you know, Luke, you gave me a very good insight when you were bringing up this thing about the service sector. It was a very interesting insight that about the worker age I hadn't thought about. It kind of reinforces, you know, mm -hmm. about, you're talking about the export. <coughs> Goeiedag. De toekomst. Leren we uit het verleden voor de toekomst. Je kunt praten over futurologie, over voorspelkunde, over prognostica. Dat was de manier waarop Fred Polak praatte over de toekomst. Maar je kunt ook gewoon zeggen, wat zijn de lessen van de geschiedenis? En hebben we ze wel begrepen? We hebben in het Westen, in de moderne tijd, een beetje de neiging om te zeggen, nou, als het niet in de computer kan, als het niet met IT te maken heeft, dan is het oud, dan is het achterhaald, dan uh, is het niet logisch. Dat idee van oorzaak en gevolg, zoals we dat sinds Descartes, hè, het Cartesiaanse stelsel, hebben... Er is altijd een oorzaak voor een gevolg. Kant heeft er veel over geschreven. Ja, daar zitten we een beetje aan vast. Maar is dat wel zo? Zijn er geen dingen die een soort tijdloze waarheden zijn, die we misschien een beetje vergeten zijn? Kijken we in het Westen niet te veel naar het materiële en te weinig naar het spirituele? Nou, een futuroloog, als je hem zo mag noemen, maar eigenlijk iemand die probeert trends uit het verleden te zien en door te trekken, is Larry Taub. Hij komt uit Amerika, we gaan met hem praten. Hij heeft een boek geschreven dat heet Sex, Age and the Last Cast. En uh, ik moet zeggen, dat past een beetje bij mijn bezoek aan India de afgelopen weken. Want ook daar ben ik weer in aanraking gekomen met dat kastensysteem. U weet het wel, je hebt uh, vier kasten en dan heb je nog een, mensen die er buiten vallen, de paria's, de outcast. Maar die vier kasten die... Merk je het nog steeds in India en Nepal. Je hebt dus de, de brahmanen, dat zijn zeg maar de spirituele leiders, de priesters. Je hebt de mensen die politieman zijn of uh, soldaat. Je hebt de mensen van de middenstand, zeg maar de handelaren. En je hebt de werkers. En iedereen valt op een of andere manier wel in een van die groepen. Nou, Larry Taub heeft daar een boek over geschreven. En we gaan met hem praten over zeg maar, de historische tendens. Heeft dat kastensysteem misschien toch waarde die we vergeten zijn... Waar we iets van kunnen leren. Het gesprek gaat in het Engels, want zo gaat het. Larry comes from uh, the States. Okay, welcome Larry. Let's Thank do you. this in English. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> be a lot easier. I understood a lot of what you said, though. <laughs> okay. Um, let's start. Where are you from? I'm from Newark, New Jersey, originally. Newark. Yeah. Newark. We know that because sometimes a plane doesn't go to uh, Kennedy Airport; it goes to Newark. Oh, Newark is much better than Kennedy. Yes, really. and then you take the little. Uh, Either a boat or you go under the subway to New York City. Yeah, under the tunnel. Under yeah. the tunnel, yes. Right. Yeah, I, I remember that. It's another way to get into New York. Right. Yeah. Now, people from New Jersey are always seen as the worker class for New York, eh? Yeah, recently that's been the case. When I was born, uh, we, we thought of New Jersey as a separate place completely from New York, but that's changed a lot. Yeah. It's sort of become a bedtown region, or at least that's what I hear, but I, I haven't yeah, lived yeah, there for yeah. so long, I don't know yeah. the details. Talking about caste, it yes. seems that the police people from New York live there. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's, a, there's whole areas that are full with, uh, with people from the police force that bought houses in New Jersey? I believe that's the case, yeah. I, I, I'm yeah, yeah, not yeah. too familiar with the present situation yeah, in that uh, much detail. Yeah. But okay. uh, you, You've traveled? I mean, you haven't lived there for a long time now? Uh, that's right, I haven't lived for a long time there. I've been living mostly in Japan, in Tokyo. Mm. Where, where did you live in Tokyo? Uh, well, uh, mostly I, be I lived in uh, two areas mainly. One is uh, what they call Meidai Mai. It's in Setagaya Ku, Setagaya Ward, which is on the west of the city, not far from Shinjuku. And I've also lived a long time in Takadano Baba, which is right on the, uh, what they call the loop. Yeah, the circle line that the goes around. Line, yeah, right. I've, I've been in Tokyo many times, right. and uh, uh, when you talk about Shinjuku Station, I remember those huge, enormous buildings where the big Japanese corporations, in those times they were very rich. Right. Now they seemingly are a little bit on the, on the downside. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was amazed. Japan, so many people, 
pressed into and and the amazing thing was that the train stop people get in then and then there were special guys who would push right. those few remaining passengers into the train and really you know ah, get right, them in right, yeah, right. it was it was yeah, it I, yes i've been pu i've been pushed by one of those guys also but that's usually during the rush hour yeah yeah and it was not unfriendly it was like no. getting maximum amount of people in right, the in right. the in the trains right. yeah yeah no, not unfriendly at all yes though. but going against our western feeling of mm -hmm. of privacy of space you know don't come in too close no no in japan they they like rats you know <laughs> well you still feel private even though you're part of the crowd yeah, yeah because it's people mm. Have a different attitude towards. Right, they exactly. close their eyes. They don't look at you. Yeah, right. that's what I also noted noted in India with mm -hmm. the caste system that the Brahmin uh, people looked different. I had a situation where there was the police charging, and uh, we were on a spot where we shouldn't be there, and we were with the Brahmin boy, and he just stood there and he looked at the police like you're not going to touch me, and they didn't. Right. And then I felt that the caste system, because the police were probably all there from the warrior caste normally i believe so yeah. yeah yeah and he was a brahmin he w they couldn't touch him he was above their status in life right. so there was like feeling the caste system really now yeah. let's talk about it you wrote a book sex age and the last caste right mm -hmm. what i understood from it is that you say we have not appreciated the origins of the caste system now le yeah. let's talk a little bit about that where does the caste system come well, from well, uh, the caste system seems to have evolved from some basic ideas about caste that were uh, written in the Vedas. Uh, the people who wrote the Vedas, which I think is approximately 1200 BC, uh, they had a really profound insight about caste, and, I, and the caste system is what you might say a corruption or a, an outgrowth of that of those original ideas. Now the idea, the, you can say a lot of things good and bad about the caste system. Uh, L let's explain a little bit the caste system yeah. again. So a caste system, what we see in India and some other countries, mm. is where the population is divided in something that you come into by birth right. and you can't really change. You are in this or this, say a mm -hmm. Brahmin, which is the priest caste, or in the right. warrior caste, or you're in the, in the uh, middle class, merchant uh, caste, or you are a worker or you were an outcast, right. in which means you don't fit in society, you live on the outskirts of town. Right. And in the old days, you didn't, didn't have like what you call civil rights. Right. Yeah. Those four castes have so existed for thousands of years. Right. Kind of. It was abolished since 1945, 1949, when mm -hmm. India became independent. Gandhi was uh, opposed to caste, but mm -hmm. as I said, even today, you, you notice it's still a caste society right. to a large right. extent. Right. Now, that caste system had, as you say, comes from the Vedas. Now, I've read a little bit by chance in my hotel room, because television is really horrible in India, mm -hmm. about the origin. And what I understood is that in those old books, it was more like codes of conduct mm -hmm. for a certain profession. Right. If you were a priest, yeah. this was the way you have to, be, you, this were your obligations, right. your responsibilities, how you had to live. Right. Your, moral, ethical, and spiritual obligations. Right. Everybody right. knew that if you were a warrior, this was your code of conduct. Right. It doesn't say, not in those old Vedas, in old texts I've seen, that you're born into the caste. It was more, you have that profession and that's the way you have to, to mm -hmm. act. Right. And it was quite good. I mean, it was like a law that says, if you're a policeman, integrity and vigilance and service, yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What I read it, it didn't look like what we perceive as the caste system was which was a, uh, a horrible, uh, stratified, mm. uh, inescapable, right. uh, degrading way of keeping some people in and some people out. Right, right. How did we come from that original Veda to today's caste? Well, uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure about how that developed, but uh, one thing I want to uh, focus on is that I. I believe that it came from some original insights about how people basically can be classified according to four characteristics. Now, somehow or other, the, 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 uh, the, the, the sages, the wise people, or whoever it was that wrote the Vedas, somehow had this very profound insight that you could put people or classify people basically according to four categories. At the same time, they may have thought that uh, 
this was grounds for developing uh, certain rules and restrictions for each caste and they developed a kind of a social structure out of it and from that social structure the caste system evolved and uh, okay now, uh, yeah. an interjection but here what I understand from the Hindu and the Indian culture they rather classified people in a typology according to their five elements Eater mm -hmm. is a little bit strange, but you had air, you had fire, water, mm -hmm. and earth. Right. Now, is there a relationship between those four elements and, your, and the four castes, that uh, you think? Uh, there might be, but uh, I have uh, mainly focused on uh, the, the four castes themselves, rather than try to uh, invest... Yeah, but in, like in India, they would say, you are a fire person, you know, right. they tell me I'm a fire person. Right. <laughs> Uh, or you are an earth person. Now I right. can imagine that earth has something to do with work and with mm -hmm. being grounded, right. you know, material world yeah. and, and yeah. Uh, maybe water with streams. Right. But you haven't done... No, I, I focused basically, f uh, what I found significant was not so much the speculation, from our point of view, it would be speculation about whether these associations between the five elements and the forecasts are true or not, but what I found was just by focusing on the forecasts themselves and that there was a correlation between that and, and reality, the way people do function and the way history evolved. And I just focus on that basic idea from which all of this theory evolved. And I, f I feel that this is enough to work with and I found it very effective in developing okay. it. You're referring to this theory, the theory that is outlining your book Sex, Age right. and the Last Cast. Yes. Can we find this on the internet somewhere? Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, <laughs> is there a website where... I do have a website uh, in which I've de yeah, developed these ideas. I haven't put the book on the website. No, no, but where can we find this website? Uh, well, un under my name. Uh, I, I'm still developing the website. Yes, but, but it is okay. Larry Lawrence Taub or That's Larry... T L Lawrence Taub, most of d my friends. Dot or, or oh, no, no, no. It's Larry Taub. Yes. Dot... Uh, Larry da Larry Taub dot tripod dot com. Okay. W W W tripod. La no, right. Larry Taub. I'll, I'll, I'll we put it on the on yeah, the screen. Okay. okay. So people can find a little bit more. We have some. Uh, we show some uh, of your uh, diagrams about mm -hmm. your caste system. Right. So your theory basically says there are four basic castes in the world. Right. Not only did it have some link to reality in the old days right. when the Vedas were written, because yeah. they were related to work and personality types but they also simplif uh, signify ages in the development of that's our right. world. And that's where not only the past, but the future comes in, isn't that's it? That's right. Uh, there were, these were two separate ideas in the Vedas. First of all, there was one idea which divided uh, all people into four class, castes. Not just Indian people, but this, this applies to the uh, people all over the world. Uh, if you look closely, you can basically put people into these four different castes, one or the other of these four different castes. Basically, the four castes are either a spiritual or religious caste, yep. which they call the Brahman, a warrior caste, which they call the Kshatriya, but I'll leave these uh, Sanskrit names aside, a merchant caste and a worker caste. So you have a spiritual or religious caste, a warrior caste, a merchant caste, and a worker caste. Now. Everybody has aspects of all four of these castes. We are all, to some extent, spiritually oriented. We all work. We all buy and sell things like the merchant. We all engage in some sort of competition or combat like the warrior. But one caste... Uh, let me get it right. You can say, me as a person, could say I'm a, maybe a little bit of a warrior. I'm mostly right. a warrior. But I do recognize aspect of the spiritual and, and the worker right. and the merchant in me. Yes. But, uh, so you said, but there is but like one predominant yeah. feature. Right. Usually in each person, one predominant feature, uh, what one feature tends to predominate. For example, the merchant caste, uh, people who are, their main orientation in life is money and wealth and acquiring possessions. Their, if that is their main raison d'etre or goal in life, they would be in the merchant caste. If their main concern is learning a skill very well and they identify very strongly with their skill or job or company, they're in the worker caste. If their orientation is winning, fighting, conquering, uh, mm -hmm. engaging in competition like sports people or uh, 
warriors, then they're in the warrior caste. But if their main goal in life is to understand uh, the basic questions of life, why are we here, who is God, is there a God, what is God, uh, who am I, what is my deeper, what, what does my inner voice say, then we are spiritual or religious oriented. So one of those features tends to predominate in each person, and that's the caste we belong to. Okay, and right. does that go beyond the personality level in the sense that organizations or countries or... Right. Now, there is both a... Uh, first of all, different uh, cultures t tend also to belong to different castes. For example, uh, in my own culture for the last couple of hundred years from the United States, I would say that, um, that uh, a lot of the culture has been oriented mainly towards money. So you might say that the United States is in the merchant caste or is a merchant caste oriented country. Uh, the countries in ancient times, in the medieval a uh, Middle Ages, yeah. most of them were oriented toward building empires, conquest, uh, conquering. Uh, yeah, but you could also say that the United States in their early history was more of a farming country and building up their industrial complexes. So mm -hmm. it used to be a worker and now it's more of a merchant. No, it was, it was more of a merchant in the sense that... Uh, uh, trading. Y yeah, trading, building up industry was the main thing. Now, the southern states, one, one of the interesting things about U.S. history is that uh, as I go into in the book, well, <laughs> there's yeah, some yeah, preliminary yeah. thing. The, it's not only that different cultures fall into different castes, it's also that the world as a whole is evolving. There is a timeline, a historical line. In other words, as I started to say, in the Vedas, there were two different ideas which were later combined. One was the idea that there were four castes, that, the, the, that all people could be classified into four castes. At the same idea, at the same time, the Veda writers had an idea about history, what they call a cosmological idea. And that is that history evolves through four ages, a golden age, a silver age, a copper age, and an iron age. Uh, people who are familiar uh, with it. Is this called yugas also? Yugas, right. Yeah, we There's the Kali Yuga. Satya Yuga, there was the uh, Treta Yuga, the Dvapara Yuga, and what they call the Kali Yuga, the Dark Age. Now, later on in their later literature... I mean, uh, maybe I, uh, yeah. another interjection. When yes. I was there, it said that the Kali Yuga would end when more than five million people, or whatever they call crore, eh, this ten, right. like 10 million people at the same time would say the same mantra, whatever. And there was a hope that at this Kumbha Mela, where they claimed there were 30 million people, and I don't believe there were more than five, but okay, mm -hmm. that that energy would actually lead to a new era. Right. That so the end of the Kali Yuga mm -hmm. might come at this Kumbha Mela because this was the largest gathering of people ever right. in the history of mankind with all right. the same energy. Right. Now maybe it happened, maybe it didn't happen, but funny enough, what happened was an earthquake. Mm, oh, oh, that's right. In in, Gujarat, in India, there was a which was also the largest earthquake, it, 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 and which is of course a horrible thing, and people should support the, the people there. But politically, it came at a very, very. Uh, yeah, good moment actually because there was a growing growing war between India and Pakistan over the Kashmir uh, Yammu area where mm -hmm. there was uh, you know which is Muslim versus um, Hindu. Uh, Hindu but also uh, the power over the Karakoram uh, route uh, the route to China mm -hmm. the way to protect the old interests of India mm -hmm. over that that route that is now in the hands of Pakistan I mean this is a real mm -hmm. sensitive area in the world so just as that was mounting to another, uh, to another uh, crisis, and specifically about a, a temple in Ayodhya, mm -hmm. the Ram Temple, and on the 29th they were going to announce when the Ram Temple was to be rebuilt. Mm -hmm. And there were already spiritual leaders were flocking to the Kumbha Mela, like the Dalai Lama on the 25th. Right. And then on the 26th, puff! There was an earthquake, right. which has now led to better relationship between India and mm -hmm. Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Very strange situation. It's yes. like, like, if you look at it in a, in a, in a wider historical content, the two things came together, like the Kumbha Mela and right. this new friendship, or you can yeah. call it friendship, but, but neighborship between the countries yeah. came at a very, very mm. auspicious moment, really. Yes, yeah? yes. So, yeah. But that about 
these 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 time frames. So yes. there was there was a feeling that maybe the Kali Yuga has ended at a new era that we will call right. sometimes the uh, Aquarius time. Yes. Kind of is happening. Right. So, well, I, uh, yes, I. Uh, uh, it could be that this particular specific happening is a sign that these changes are taking place. But we, even without looking at specific signs, if we look at history in generally, just generally, we can see a connection. And uh, the basic historical idea that you found in the Vedas was that. Uh, that there are these four ages, one would come after the other, these different yugas. And then later on, they took these two ideas, the idea of the four castes and the idea of the different ages, and they combined them. Now, this combination, as far as I know, after looking, investigating, is not in the Vedas, but later on in the uh, written tradition, and the, uh, maybe it was more the oral tradition, they tied the two ideas together, and they said that they, the Golden Age is dominated by the religious or spiritual caste. The Silver Age is dominated by the warriors. Then comes an age dominated by the merchants. And finally, the Kali Yuga is dominated by the workers. Now, um, and it happened to be we have six billion people at the moment. It's, most of them are workers. Yeah, most of them <laughs> workers. Exactly yeah. right. Well, in any case, um, the the Indians believed, or the ancient, or the way it comes down to us, they looked at time cyclically. And, and so they saw this process as going on and repeating itself endlessly for very long periods of time uh, until finally the world would be destroyed and then it would start over. Now, I took, what I did was... Isn't this the image of Brahma, the god, sitting on a leaf on the water, right. on, a, on a lotus leaf and right. contemplating and with every breath that's There's right. a new universe coming That's into existence, which goes through endless right. yugas and yugas, yes. and then comes back, and then with the next breath, right. Right. kind of brings you in perspective. You know, we sitting here in a <laughs> world and millions right. of years, and so on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. However, I, I, I ignored, virtually ignored, all of the mythology surrounding these ideas, and look, just looked at the two basic ideas themselves: the idea of the forecasts and the idea of the cyclical the cyclical ages. And I found that um, the, there was a correspondence with real history. Uh, basically, I'm a historian. I studied history. That was my major field. And I found, and uh, I sort of have a general sense of the flow of history, and I found that miraculously, for some reason, this idea actually can be easily applied to history as we know it, and it does correspond that, that, that the, the ages as dominated by the different castes, was actually the way history evolved and is still evolving into the yeah. future. Yeah. And, and I think that when you look at uh, it, clear, it's yeah. explained in the it's book. It's explained yeah. in the book that, you know, the different uh, castes, because as we're talking, the book is called Sex, Age, and the Last Case. Right. The Last Caste. Yes. Um, the, not the last case, actually. <laughs> Cast, yeah, right. Yeah, the last case of beer, you know. I think last that's an interesting. Of, right. Sex, Age, and the Last Case well, of Beer. Well, probably with <laughs> a case of beer, you can see the whole evolution much more clearly, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, but so you have this forecast, right. worker, merchant, warrior, and religious spirit that you see going through the history. And you That's see it right. also in every country, how it develops from one right. to another. Right. But now, looking into the future, do you believe that we are on the verge of going towards the end of the, of the worker era again to a spiritual era? Yes, exactly. That's the case. But uh, let me make that a bit clear because I want to clarify a couple of points of this. Number one... Uh, in addition to this, uh, what I call caste model, in other words, which is based on these Hindu ideas, I look at two other models. There are two other ways also of looking at history. One which I, uh, as you see from the title of the book, Sex, Age, and, and Caste, yeah. there is what I call a sex model and an age model. And these two other models help add, help describe the contents of the different caste ages. Now, the sex model basically is the idea, uh, it's based somewhat on Chinese philosophy, the concept of yin and yang. And according to uh, my observation of history, there was a dialectical pro process that occurred in history whereby history, human history, went also through three sexual stages. The first one was a yin stage oriented toward the female principle, followed by a yang stage oriented toward the male principle, we're sort of at the tail end of that stage, and then 
we are now going into a androgynous, or you might say bisexual age, in which the male and female principles become balanced. Now, the Indian... But wait a moment, wait a moment. If you say there's three stages, it's yeah. cyclical. We went from female to male to now, say, something in between. Yeah. We, so the next stage should be metacarp... A, fem a female again? No, no cycles. This is the thing. This is the point I was about to stress. According to this idea, if you look at history, the Indian philosophy developed out of uh, uh, a prehistoric sense of time, which was cyclical. Now, to view time as cyclical is actually something that comes from the female principle. When we went into the masculine or yang age, we started looking at time linearly, from past to present to future in a straight line. So uh, what I did was, in explaining the caste model, I first of all tried to compensate, I, I got rid of the Indian cyclical view of time and replaced it with a spiral view, a combination of the female sense of cyclical time with the male sense of linear time and, accord and when you look at this what you see is that human history goes through only one Wait cycle. One. We have cycles and we right. have going progress and that's you call the spiral so it's going that's somewhere. Right. Yes. Yep. right so my conclusion was by trying to make the, the caste model androgynous in other words a combination of a female or cyclical view of time plus a male linear view of time, the idea seemed clear that human history itself, the entire human history, including the future, makes up one complete cycle only. What came before that cycle was animal. And what comes after, I feel, would probably be, if we live through it, a higher stage of human evolution. You might call it post-human. Genetically manipulated human beings or androids or whatever. I'm a little bit afraid of I that. I wouldn't uh, be that specific. I suspect that it, 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 it's not, I, I suspect that uh, it will be uh, something we don't expect. It will be neither man plus the machine, something much more subtle. I don't know. I don't go into the, to the post future. I'm more concerned with the rest of the human future. I think the post future is beyond us in the same way that for, for a, an ape or a monkey or one of our ants, uh, for, for one of the beings earlier on the evolutionary mm. scale than us, for them to understand us is virtually yeah, impossible. So we cannot so really we predict. We can't really predict or uh. understand. We can't even use the word history when we talk about post-humanity because history applies only to, to the human mm. yeah, 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 race. Yeah. Their sense of time might well, be completely but if different. If I walk to Amsterdam <laughs> and I look around, I see <laughs> the way we're going is Mac-Man, you know? Yeah, the, right. the, the, the ultimate consumer, we, we, we're no longer, we are seen as human spiritual beings, we're seen as people with a purse, an electronic purse, who go from shop to shop and get what is fed to us. So mac -Man, you know, like right. McDonald's, mac -Man, uh, well, yes. endless consumers seen to our database uh, in someone's computer, say, oh, this guy has right. eaten so many hamburgers and so much of this and he has uh, he needs five cars in his life and this and he's going to pay so much tax and this right. and that and that oh yeah by the way we make him work some stupid job because uh yeah, yeah we have to keep them busy you know right yeah. well i think these are very much characteristics of our present worker age now we're like cattle in that sense yes. yeah but it, it, this emphasis on quantity on consumerism these are these are characteristics which started in the merchant age and have reach their high point in the worker age, but as we go into a spiritual age, I think there's gonna be a, a mm. big qualitative shift. But, at, but in, in order to really, uh, to give that what I just said some meaning, I should emphasize that my conclusion about the, uh, what the cycle of the four ages was, was I observed, or I felt I observed, that human history began first with a religious age which saw the development of religion from, you know, uh, prehistoric animistic type religion all, all the way up to the establishment of the great world religions, you know, Zoroastrianism, mm -hmm. Judaism, uh, Hinduism, Christianity, Islam, and Buddhism. Then the warrior age corresponds mainly to the ancient world and the Middle Ages, when the world was dominated by kings and emperors and conquerors and generals and the aristocracy. And the merchant age corresponds to the early stages of capitalism. And finally, the worker age, which is our present time, corresponds pretty much to 
corporate capitalism, big government, uh, communism. But, and, and the, I feel that the, em the great emphasis on, on science, technology, et cetera, is very much a part of the worker age. And as we go from the worker age into the final human age, which is, I call it a spiritual age or spiritual religious age, again, we, we go back, in a sense, we go back to the beginning of a cycle, but this is a cycle that a a newer cycle. A, it's a uh, at a higher level. At a higher before. level, right? It's a transition between the human history and the post-human, post whatever we call it. So when we enter this spiritual age, we're going to see big changes uh, uh, from our present uh, uh, um, focus on business, economics, we're science, going in technology, in into a much more in, into into a, an age where we're going to attempt to apply. Uh, a spiritual um, uh, control or yeah. add a new spiritual direction okay, to but what this, we've this already in your view would also then mm -hmm. relate to a new caste taking over the leading right. role that's so correct. from the worker from the people into the material world we will again be uh, guided or be, be led by the spiritual people by a spiritual people yes uh, so that's right now I'm going all the practicals yes. for years I've said I believe that, in other words, and with a different vision, we're going into an age where instead of looking at the outside as influencing the inside, we're going again to an age where the inside exactly. is seen as the originator of what, what happens in the outside. That's correct. Which yes. would lead to a new need for understanding and, and contact with right. things. Um, so I've, I've said we should have newer universities, again, maybe not in the old sense religious university, but call them universities of magic or university of uh, whatever spirituality. Yeah? Right, right. And we should have n an educate a new class of priests, call them mages, which is a good word, or sages right. or whatever right. they're called. We, we probably shouldn't call them priests or sages pastors. Sages sounds good. I sages, like that word. Yes. <laughs> um, and then we should start looking into the educational system now to prepare for that but nobody mm -hmm. seems to do it the only thing i see is go for it uh, yes, have right. a career in mm -hmm. in chips uh, uh developing right. you know mm -hmm. we yes. need more software we need more websites and more that kind of stuff nobody right. talks about more understanding of the belief more right. understanding of the basic psychological right. thing more philosophical right so yes. Could a conclusion of your book be, or a practical conclusion, that we have to change the direction of our educational and, and the system well, slowly? Well, uh, actually, to prepare? actually, I think that uh, whether we try to do it or not, I think it's going to get done somehow. Now, we, we, uh, it, it's a bit complicated, but there are all sorts of political political elements to this as well. I think a lot of these changes is not so much a question of what we in in uh, the more developed countries of the world decide to do. I think that will that is part will of come what is happening. You, if but you say this is an inev inevitable pattern, mm -hmm. you're actually saying it's happening. I would say it's happening, but it, it's a, a lot of the causes or the, the impulse toward it is coming from unexpected places. And this has to do a lot with the political uh, aspects because uh, it's not, this is not just a worldwide process. A different parts of the world play different roles in this development. And uh, for example, I, I mentioned earlier that different cultures belong to different castes. And uh, one pattern that seems to be repeated as these ages uh, develop, first of all, L we, let's make that practical. Yeah. You could say that say the Tibetans, um, the, I mean right. the, more, the more religious oriented, are of the religious priest caste. I would say that Tibet as a culture is in the, the spiritual, spiritual caste. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spiritual yeah. religious uh, caste. A merchant country could be like America. Uh, the United States would be the typical merchant country. How would you classify Japan? You live there a long Japan, time. Well, again, here we get into a very interesting process which I tried to detail in the book. Japan I would classify as belonging mainly to the worker caste. Also China and Korea. Now. Um, but is that true? When, when I, I, I happen to have been in Japan a long time, I feel a deep-rooted spirituality. Mm -hmm. um, amazingly, I was one time at Shinjuku, uh, Sanchome, which is the second uh, little corner of Shinjuku, right. uh, and where there's a lot of Western bars and whatever. But I was invited for a street festival. And I said, uh, tomorrow you come, and uh, you know, you, you dress easy. Mm -hmm. 
And I didn't really understood what that meant. But the next day I come and I was given one of these Japanese things and whatever. And I was put in a line with other guys and they made me carry a, um, a statue. Oh, a statue. Mm -hmm. A statue of the neighborhood god or the deity or whatever. Right. So, and it was music and drumming. But as soon as I started walking, it became clear what the whole deal was, is after about 10 meters, you stopped and someone was giving you sake. Right. And you had to drink the sake and then you mm. moved on to the next uh, shop or whatever. And then they stopped, you got more sake. And there were maybe 50 people all around. And from the back, you were pushed to the front. Right. And from the front, so the guy there, he, he fell off and went to the back. But after a few hundred meters, of course, everybody was drunk like a horse. Mm. And they, there were also women in between and guys, and they took some liberty, so to speak. It was like they would pinch your... your your backs and whatever it was like yeah. it was a really but at the same time singing and dancing and this whole statue right. was carried around and i got a feeling that this was really a cultural thing there it, yes. it had to do amidst these enormous skyscrapers yes. yes yes there was attachment to the reality right. to the friends and i felt part of that neighborhood and I will always when I go there well, I will feel part of the neighborhood because right. I remember the shops where they right. gave me the free drinks right. and how the the whole and there was absolutely no racial or or, or even I was white so I was a guy right. but I was part of it right. as long as I drank with them and 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 partied with them right. we were all one in this and then I realized that there is a an undercurrent in Japan mm -hmm. very yes. much spiritual much yes. more spiritual than yes. their system of workers That's and right. yeah uh, I would put it this way First of all, every culture, even in the United States, every culture has a spiritual root or basis to it because every culture, to one extent or another, goes through all of the four ages. And uh, as we go through each age, that age <coughs> tends to dominate in throughout the world. Uh, it is true that some cultures kind of uh, are are uh, maybe out of the general mainstream for a while and they don't go through every age in order they skip ages and then come back into the mainstream later on but there is throughout all human culture there's a basic spiritual level and that is very much true in China Japan the United States in Europe uh, there's a religious basis to all society because the whole world went through a first spiritual age which is still with us but when I say that Japan belongs to the worker caste more than anything. I mean it in this sense. First of all, uh, the, as each age developed, certain countries became powerful. And they were the countries that most belonged to the caste that dominated that age. In other words, in the warrior age, we had the great empires from the Hittites and the Sumerians and the Assyrians and the Han Dynasty in China. Uh, during the warrior age, those countries that were most that most developed to be in tune with the skills related to war became powerful. As the warrior age disappeared and was replaced by the merchant age, those countries such as the Netherlands, Britain, uh, France, eventually Germany, Japan, and other Portugal, countries. Yeah, yeah. Portugal, Portugal, no, no, Portugal and Spain. I I classified more as the the high point of the warrior age, mainly because they didn't embrace the, the, the uh, they kind of suppressed the growth of their bourgeois class, their, their, mer their merchant caste, and as a result, they got sort of stuck in the warrior age, didn't make the jump the into the Jews merchant their, their age, their they expelled guys. the Jews and all of the yeah, other people who were all, involved yeah. with their bourgeoisie, their merchant caste, and because they did this, they, they failed to make the jump, Spain and Portugal failed to make the jump into the merchant age. The countries that replaced Spain and Portugal at the top, well first there was the Netherlands, the, this great revolt of the Netherlands against Spain enabled the Netherlands to become the great power of the first great power of the merchant age. They were soon followed by the British and then eventually the French and then later on in the 19th century by the Germans, the Japanese, the Italians. In other words... Larry, yes. if you were the first to enter a new age, yes. are you the last to leave or what? That's <laughs> the tendency is, the problem is, if you're I mean, too successful in the one age, you tend to fall behind greatly in the following age. And 
This, I'm afraid, is what's happening in the United States right now. We are too stuck in that highly individualistic, capitalistic, money-oriented mentality that has developed so to, to bring the United States to great worldwide mm -hmm. success that we are falling behind a little in the uh, present worker age. But where, where, you know? where do you spot the next spiritual, religious-oriented well, uh, nations then? Well, first of all, uh, I would say that during the next 30 years, uh, the warrior age developed imperialism. Imperialism was the way of bringing countries together economically. In the merchant age, imperialism was turned into a business venture. In other words, they took the imperialistic idea capitalistic that imperialism. and they turned it into capitalistic imperialism. Now, in the worker age, we more or less do not accept any kind of imperialism. Of course, we have it, but it's not generally accepted or acknowledged, like slavery. We still have slavery, but slavery is officially abolished, and you have to look to certain places of the world to, to find it. In the same way, imperialism has now become out uh, at the, with the end of with the merchant age, which is now ending, imperialism is also disappearing and is being replaced by unions. The European Union, blocks of countries. You have labor yeah. unions, you have uh, neighborhood unions, professional unions. You also have unions of small countries combined into blocks. And this process started uh, to show to illustrate this very clearly. The fact that the very first important union of countries was formed here in Europe, mainly consisting of the former major imperialistic powers of the merchant age. So the, the imperialistic powers of the merchant age lost their empires and now they formed with their, base, with their own countries a new European Union, uh, which is the, the hallmark of the worker age. Now, this unionization process is continuing throughout the world. First, there's the European Union. Oh, yeah, yeah, we see yeah. it in South America, we see right. it in Southeast Asia, right. SARC uh, countries, are, they're working together. But where are the nations that are going to lead okay. us into the next spiritual well, age? As the worker age reaches its peak, I think this union process will continue. And I think that the uh, industrialized North, both North and South will continue to form blocks political economic unions. But I see over the next 30 years the formation of a ranking of power uh, among three unions in the northern hemisphere, or what they call the north. Japan uh, declining in its economic power. That may be true, but if you look at Japan not as a single country, but as part as a, a, a country working together with China and Korea very closely, to look at the whole thing, it, I, it doesn't really matter what, what, much what Japan as a country is doing. I see this as emerging as the number one block. And then I see as a number two block, Powers. In other words, you can call it a North Pole block or a polar block. In the book, I call it Polario. It consists essentially of Russia. Together isn't that in what's an alliance, always happening which makes them number yeah. three. Yeah, but, but yeah. Larry, that's, isn't that what history teaches us? I mean, France and Germany are now in the European Union. They were right. 
you know, uh, enemies for hundreds of years. Yeah. Uh, there's always exactly. Yes, what you fight, yeah. you become. That's right. Um, Russia has been fighting uh, capitalism and has become it. Uh, That's right. Some people say that that uh, vice versa. America has become far more socialistic than it ever would admit. That's true. Yes, yeah. it has become a great deal yeah. socialistic from the yeah yeah from the past from the past. Yeah. Now I have so another theory. See if this fits in. Um, for me, demographics are a driving force in the future, and we can predict that the Western world is short of workers. Right. But so we can predict that China is short of women. I women? Think, yes. Uh, th because... Um, oh, yes. Right. And we're talking about 100 or 130 million missing women. Yes, of now, course. Now, since these kids there c get children when they're 13, 14, mm. 113, 130 million missing women makes 260 million missing mothers. That's right. Yes. At an average, people would, get, would need to get at least two and a half times their number of children right. to to stay at a, st a stable level so that's already that's 160 right. 260 or 300 million 15 years later and we're not too far off we're already in the second stage you talk 500 million missing chinese right and that goes on right um you see the baby boomers in 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 india the, the enormous group that we have also happens in india right uh, you see still a lot of children but i i noticed that there was a feeling that there's a little bit more control there right so you get a similar uh patterns that we have seen in the west only maybe 10 or 15 years later that's right no, that's and we might get a whole reversed world order because yeah. what do you and i need in 10 years time sorry to say but what, what's your age my age, uh, I just turned 65. Um, you're uh, 65. About, uh, in 10 years' time, ago. you're going to need care and service, yes? That's correct. Yeah. Yes? Yes. And so do most of the baby boomers, and you're a little bit... Yeah? I'm a little bit older than, than the baby that, boomers. But yes. you feel the need for service. For right. For, so I think that the real power in the world will be those nations who have the working force. Right. That's, that's, that's And so yeah. Africa, Asia, mm -hmm. may, may, maybe even to a lesser extent uh, South and Central America right. have enormous amounts of people that right. are able to do those service jobs. Right. So I think in, there is, apart from that, a new world order. There's right. a second thing, it's the environmental uh, impact. We've seen the story about uh, uh, COT um, uh, emission rights, yes? Yes. Countries that have... COT. CO2. CO2. CO2, okay. the, right. the, the uh, coal monoxide uh, and yeah, dioxide. Uh, carbon the emission dioxide. Carbon dioxide. We see that there is also a change in evaluation of a, the power of a nation. Right. We see the oil. I just heard it in, I think, in Kazakhstan. They found oil reserves that are worth 25 years of ah. the world usage. Mm. Yes. Just mm. puff, they found this. Yes. Right. 25 years more. Um, a fuel for the world. Mm -hmm. Now, if they find that, we know they'll find more and more and more in the coming years all right. over the place. Right. So you see a power shift in the world right. that is not necessarily related to merchants, as you say, or uh, or our type of business. Yes, uh, but I, I I still think that this power shift is also embodied or for, uh, foreseen or how shall I say it, part of this caste model because when I spoke of this uh, these three great blocks of the north I was talking only of the worker age over the next 30 years in the middle of the f this century of the this century now yeah, I, I see a further shift as we go from the worker age to the spiritual age I think there's another shift to power which will uh, move more toward the more um, Power will event as we go in away from the worker age and away from the emphasis on the manufacturing uh, hardware sector of the economy toward a more, slight, as you said, service-oriented economy. Uh, we will find that uh, ultimately the the most important service in the world is the service on telling people how to live, how to how to the happiness business. Ha happiness business. So yeah. that in the lo long run, first of all, I see the, the religious market or the religion market or the spiritual market emerging as a major economic sector. But when we, uh, part of this 
shift in economic sectors is also related. Is it a boost that sold out to the uh, to that market yet? Uh, <laughs> Already. <laughs> Uh, actually, that that has been a major factor in American in the, in, in the last elections. Yes, right. There, th 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 that is part of this general process. Uh, uh, it, however, it will have its international political implications as well because you have a a, gr a, a a bunch of nations that have not yet formed these unions right in the middle of the world, stretching from, as you mentioned, Tibet. belong, if you look at them very deeply, their basic caste of orientation is the religious or spiritual caste, which means that as religion and spirituality become the main focus in people's lives, it has economic implications which will tend to shift power away from the, uh, from the northern industrialized countries whose power No, uh, now that comes at a later stage, uh, the, uh, the final stage of human... I think, I think that this religious belt will also form unions, four, at least four unions, probably four. One would consist of um, And he That's stressed right. that Hinduism and, and Buddhism don't differ that much, right. that, uh, that the tradition of Gautama Buddha came from the Hinduism That's right. and so That's on right. and so He was kind of yeah. uh, making amends, coming closer. Yeah. But also you felt it was going against the Muslims, who then from Pakistan onwards to the, to the West. Yeah, I don't think it goes so much against the Muslims. You know, it, this has to do a little bit with the sex model, because uh, basically, what happened at the beginning of the warrior age, at the dawn of history, the world split up into two sexual regions. This is another area the which paternalistic is and the maternalistic. Yeah, the, the Yes, yes. A, a, a male god right. that governs the world. Right. Transcendental god rather yes. than Versus immanent. Versus the Brahman uh, idea, the, the Hindu idea right. of an all-pervasive god that right. is more imminent, earth yeah. imminent. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. And both in Hinduism and Buddhism, all forms of Buddhism, Mahayana, Hinayana, Benares, the city of Benares in a sense, became the Jerusalem of the East. In, other, in Eastern culture, they kept, in Western culture, they pushed out most of the female or the yin elements in the culture and became very hyper mass male oriented. In the East, they kept, uh, the, uh, they kept a lot of the female orientation from prehistoric times, such as the idea of cycles, and they put together, a, and they started moving in a male direction, but they kept a lot of the female elements so that the culture as a whole became also masculine, but much more balanced. As the male and that's pole. where the tradition of women and well, everybody, by, by the way, right. male and females, they take a dip in the Ganges, which is the water, right. the holy water that you go in, which connects, in fact, uh, the high ground right. from the from the right. Himalaya with the ocean and, and represents right. the human soul being part of it. I, th I like that ritual right. where you, and they, they sometimes travel long, long distances right. to take that dip right. in the holy river. And when they come out, they shine. Right. There is this, on their faces, the happiness of we have achieved either the removal of our sins, but reconnecting.
Yes. That's yes. very much the feeling. They have reconnected. Right. Yeah? Right. Yes. Yes. And that, that, that is a very yin thing to do, to go back to your roots, to look at things as a whole. Now, in talking about Islam, I think you have to distinguish between Islam in the subcontinent and further east and Islam in the west. Because to a great extent, the Islam in, the, uh, in Pakistan and Bangladesh, etc., is because the culture is, uh, is, comes out of this original Indian root, uh, I would, it's not so much a division between Hindu and Buddhism on one side versus Islam, Judaism, and Christianity on the other, but that even the Islam that you find in Pakistan and Bangladesh and places like Indonesia is closer to the, to the subcontinental culture than it is to Western culture. And so there, uh, I would say that one of these important religious belt unions will form in the subcontinent as a whole. It will include not only the Hindu regions and Buddhist regions, but also Islamic regions of that area. Then a second, so they will be... Uh, 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 so, and that, 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 that combines with what I just told you, the demographics. I mean, these are the yes. nations that have enough people to provide a workforce in the service industry. And that's not negatively meant, but you know, the, the people that, that can work right for the needs of other regions that need that need workers yes. so and if they plan that and if they use that wisely they will become like the oil nations of today because they will probably tax uh, expatriates when they work and stuff like that mm. yeah I'm, I'm not sure if i can uh, I, if i can uh, look at it in so much detail uh but this is, this is the discussion that goes on. Let me explain a little bit. At the yeah. moment, we already have a need for nurses. Right. And we get them from uh, South Africa and the Philippines. And in one of oh, our programs, there was a whole discussion about yes. uh, people saying, yeah, wait a minute, we're robbing these nations of their resources because right. these nurses have been trained there at the cost of the taxpayers there. Right. We get them here, we keep them here, or we, we work them off, so to speak, for a few years and send them back with little pension or none. And so we're exploiting them, and we are basically robbing those nations of their health workers right. and their infrastructure right. that build them. So that's not a nice thing to do, even if we need the people. Right. Uh, so the idea is to, if we do this, we should have trained them and make it a whole thing. Right. But there is this feeling that, that these countries should therefore tax expatriates so that the country gets back what yes. it put into the education. Yeah, I think yes. that's a fair thing. And that's do. a fair thing, but that would yeah. mean massive amounts of money flowing to those countries. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, that's in addition to the money that the people earn when they go overseas yes. to work. They do send back large, a, uh, lot, a lot of the money that is earned overseas goes back into those economies because they're sent uh, back uh, into the family. I, I guess it's two ways of looking at the same uh, process. Uh, uh, um, how, uh, I think that, uh, well. We, we were talking about those We were talking the about regions. this religious belt. Yeah. I would say that the, the Indian, Indo-Pak, Bangladesh belt uh, area it will be one of these major blocks, mm -hmm. one of these four blocks in the religious belt. I think eventually Tibet will somehow detach itself from China and be a part of this block. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a bit controversial issue, but I think eventually that will happen. A second block further to the west is what I call the um, uh, Central Asian Islamic bloc. It consists mainly of the Islamic countries that are not Arab, that are not Semite, Semitic, uh, Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, um, and uh, all of the countries that were formerly in the Soviet Union in, that are in Central Asia, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, um, well, we have, we Uzbekistan, have a yeah. there's five of them. Yeah. They, will, th they will make up another Islamic, Central Asian Islamic bloc. Then you have the Middle Eastern bloc. I call this the Pan-Semitic Federation because straight right now we're in the middle of the peace process and it doesn't look very peaceful, but eventually I see Israel, I see uh, Israel and a Palestinian state emerging and that these, all of these Arab Very powerful Malachi. federation, what I call the Pan-Semitic Federation, consisting of Israel, Palestine, uh, Saudi Arabia, Egypt. What uh, would be their, their basic economic um, well, trade? Or, as or I say, that the main in all of these in the entire religious belt, uh, the future 
economy is going to be or, 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 oriented more and more towards spirituality in the future. And what, what these countries export better than anything is religion, wisdom. Uh, right now it's very fundamentalistic, but once... Education, uh, uh, but also tourism towards those places. Yeah, tourism. I mean, you know, uh, the, religious, the religion business has many facets to it. It includes health and education. All of these religions, you know, the Jewish, Islamic, Christian, uh, Hindu, etc., they all have hospitals, they all have schools, universities, etc., Two very important parts of the what they call the service sector of economy of the economy, the health sector and the education sector, religion is very involved in this. Healing stuff like right. that. CEO economy. Yes? Huh? Good word. CEO economy. CEO economy, I love that. Yes. The CEO economy. economy. I uh, like that. Uh, yes, okay, yes. okay. We so these countries have their have what it will be very important in the middle of this century is that they are theo economic, not just computer IT oriented, but they go beyond that to, to uh, you know, we are now what they, the, the worker age is, okay, uh, the worker age is the age of knowledge, meaning head knowledge, mental knowledge. The spiritual age is the age of spiritual knowledge. It's uh, something that many futurologists well, you, you, you have point overlooked. at the heart, but the in heart fact, rather most than of, the head. No, 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 yeah. no. Most of you say there is, there is a a part of the head, which is like the logical, the reasonable thing, but there's also a part of the head, is the, it's the super exactly. uh, head, which is the, the spiritual uh, knowledge, right, yes? Right, it's yeah. this, this, this uh, chakra. Yeah, it's actually Sahasrara chakra, they call it in yes, the tantric yes, yes. tradition, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah it's so there's, uh, I think many future, like Toffler, for example, he, did, he, he talked about three types of power. The, uh, in his book, Power Shift, he talks about force, military force. That's very much the orientation of the warrior age. Mm -hmm. Then he talks about uh, money power, power of capital. That's the work, uh, merchant age. Then he talks about knowledge power, the power of knowing something, the, 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 being a technocrat, a nerd, a computer expert, an IT expert. That's knowledge power. That's very much the worker age. But what many futurologists have left out is the, the, you know, the spiritual age where we have the knowledge of the heart. And that's what I think it will happen from... The gnosis is, is the w knowledge of the heart. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I tend to differ a little bit because mm -hmm. that is a tendency to say it's all about the heart and the feelings and the emotion. Yeah, I'm what I've learned from the Hindu that there is a difference between these, these heart feelings, right. the emotional thing, yeah. which are part for the ego and, and, right. and a worldly existence, and that what yeah. resides in the Aina here, more higher. Um, I'm 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 not sure about w whether that goes. Uh, I agree with you. I think that it's more uh, it's it's oriented it's, it's here rather than here. I use that a little bit loosely, in a, a yeah. somewhat colloquial way or somewhat yeah. uh, popular way. I yes, didn't a mean popular that way. Is, oh, no, we I have didn't to live mean from the, the heart, heart in yeah. the sense of the yeah. emotions, but I meant in terms of deeper spiritual yeah. knowledge, insight. Uh, more associated with yeah. the, the seventh third eye, chakra, maybe the yeah. third eye, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the sixth chakra. And well, then then both of those both chakras, of those chakras are part of it. but so. I think that these three regions, uh, the, uh, then there's the fourth block, uh, yes. which consists of North Africa, the Maghreb. I call it the Maghreb, the Maghreb Federation, yeah. Libya, Algeria, Morocco, um, and uh, that's based uh, in Tunisia, Tunis. Those, so these four blocks in the religious belt, I think, will be the great powers. Power will shift to them. You don't see like a, a, another block in the Brazilian uh, for it, where where the Santo Dime movement and the revival of the of the uh, uh, jungle cultures and the jungle. You seem to have read my book already without reading it, because the final stage of the spiritual age. Each each age, I found another pattern has three stages. Each age has three stages. I call them a pioneering stage, where the that that cat, the new rising caste, doesn't yet have power, but it's beginning to form. And then the revolutionary stage, when this new caste is strong enough to take over countries by revolution. And if you, uh, you look at recent history, you see that bourgeois revolution corresponds to the merchant age, socialist revolution corresponds to the uh, worker mm -hmm. age, and now we already have religious revolution, like in mm -hmm. Iran and Afghanistan. Since I don't like to talk about religion, but about magic as, as <laughs> being the thing, and I think it was in France about 20 years ago, 30 years ago, there was this uh, Lobe des Magiciens, the, the, the dawn of the magic age. Uh, Le Matin des the, 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 yeah, the Matin I remember de that book Lobe, 40 yeah. years ago. Yeah, it, it was uh, Brest Planet was the, right, the magazine right, that right, went right, with right, it. Right, and uh, I always liked that phrase to see 
the magicians coming up again as exactly yes well as i started to say it's almost as if i feel that you've read my book without having read it because the the final stage of every age is a peak stage when the cast reaches its height of power and uh, normally it when you reach the highest point you're ready to fall but this is different in the spiritual age there's no falling involved as such what do you mean so, there's no falling uh, well, do you read newspapers you see the people <laughs> from the information technology who invested in the internet are going mm. flat on their nose i mean i see some, that yes that's some falling but in terms of this coming spiritual age i don't see the spiritual age as actually falling uh, uh, that, uh, that, uh, uh, it doesn't have to destroy the, the, the previous ages, that's what you're saying? Uh, well, normally the warrior age, uh, even the first religious age, and the warrior age, and the merchant age, and the worker age, the, each caste reached a high point and then started to fall. And they were replaced by the next caste. But when we enter the final spiritual age, there is not really a fall, there's a transition to a post-human society. And that final stage, I believe, is exactly what you were talking about, is a, you're talking about Amazon culture, etc. cetera. The, con the, 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 the cultures to watch at the very end of human history and the very beginning of post-human, whatever you call it, will be focused mainly on these indigenous cultures that you talked about, the ones in the Amazon, especially in Africa. Also, but not only also in the Africa. dream time from the Australia. Right, Australia. All of these indigenous cultures, I think, will play the key role in human history at the very end of history. They are the final, the final uh, focus of human history. The, the end of the cycle and the belt, beginning of the this next. This religious belt is in the middle, but as we get deeper into the religious age, the power will shift once again, and it will be a very subtle type of power, not the, so much the power of military power, but a more subtle type of spiritual power, will, will be the influence of these indigenous cultures throughout the world, and uh, a Man. lot. So the message really is, let's move to Samoa. Or Africa. Or Africa. Now, see, right yeah, now... Samoa is much nicer. It's so smaller... Well, I prefer uh, Samoa myself. Uh, uh, yes, yes uh, I prefer Samoa. Or Fiji, Fiji, or what are those places? I'll even settle for Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. Some of the islands, yeah. But <laughs> anyway... Uh, uh, so, but that's the message. You yeah. say there is... We can recognize in history not only four castes right. and, and to history their development as a caste and so we are now at the end of the worker age and maybe entering the new spiritual exactly. um, uh, priest caste age yes. so going back to it but then you look at another division which is between the maternal and the paternal mm. uh, ways of, of, of living you yeah. say Male and female. Male and female religions, yes. as we as we know, the Christians and the Jewish are a little bit more with the paternal God, That's and right. you could say in the East they more think about a, a, an Earth God, a, a exactly, female the God. Earth goddess, yeah. And then uh, I'm still puzzled with sex. I understand age uh, and age. the last caste. What is the last caste? Well, I say the last caste because. Uh, the the spiritual uh, we can already see today a movement toward this new spiritual age now there are only two countries in which religion has taken absolute power one is in in iran yeah the first religious revolution was in iran yeah. the second was in, in afghanistan uh, the tr it is never good to be in a revolution because it's very destructive and very dangerous but after there is a pattern to revolution in which it starts out with a reign of terror and then there's eventually the terrorists are pushed out, they're purged, and then there's a new pragmatic group that comes into power. And uh, as religious, with, throughout the religious belt, I expect a few more of these religious revolutions. But once these religious groups get into power, I see that... Uh, because of the fact we're also going into an androgynous age, although like for example in Afghanistan today, it's impossible for a woman to work. Women are completely suppressed in, in, once these religious groups take power. But eventually, I think that there will be a comeback of the female and of women in power in these countries. And uh, that is probably wh which will be the major platform of the of, of, of feminism. Uh, well, I'm, I'm being a little well, bit. Where uh, we're going a little bit far off. Little, yeah. let, let, let's but say, okay, but the, the last, last caste is. I would say it, we are now entering the last caste age, the age of um, the spiritual age, which is the last caste of last age of human history, and a transition to post-human whatever. Okay, so, so uh, we could say the, the last, last cast, cast might be spiritual, but it might also be robots or genetically m 
uh, engineered uh, clones? Well, I, I don't look at it so pessimistic. You, well, you know, everything has a good side and a bad side. I don't want to sound utopian. I see, I foresee in the beginning of the spiritual age lots of trouble. For example, uh, these revolutions, they're very troublesome. They're causing a great deal of chaos. Uh, another thing I should mention is that generally these, the, the pre-industrial countries that still exist, the, what they call the third world, socially, although they are integrated into the present worker age capitalist system, locally they're still much in the warrior age. They are dominated by warrior cliques, by juntas, by military people. They're still in the warrior age and as a result, even their religious revolutions take on a kind of a warrior tinge to them. So there's still a lot of destruction and danger ahead before we, we, before we go into a post-human mm. stage. However, uh, I think that uh, in the long run, um, uh, the, 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 the spiritual age will have uh, mostly a positive aspect to it in which we will find a way to live with technology so that technology becomes spiritualized. The difference between the worker age and the spiritual age is that in the worker age, technology is the main focus. Technology and all business things connected with technology are the main focus in life. The spirit is neglected. You can just look at the American health system and what's happening mm -hmm. there to see that. But, but in the spiritual age, you don't get rid of technology. You, it's mm -hmm. not a Luddite thing. You simply, it becomes part of a higher evolution in a spiritual direction. Technology becomes spiritualized. The, the, the economy becomes spiritualized. But, but the first stage will be spiritual religious future. capitalism. Come on, that in 10 years' time we will yeah. have churches that are called intellectual church and that, right. that you go there and you <laughs> bow to uh, the Intel 4 or 5 or the Intel uh, Pentium 7, which was the first with its own intellect, you know, s stuff mm. like that. And you bow to it like the Hindus do and say, oh, this is not God, but by bowing to Intel Pentium 7, we acknowledge the... I mean, I get this very, uh, very... I, unfortunately, I have to agree that this will probably... Something along these lines will probably happen at least in many of the industrialized countries. I don't see it Haven't happening Haven't you seen so people bowing to the internet? The politicians say, oh, there was a report here by some idiot who runs Schiphol and he made a report for the government about the problems of the inner city. Right. And the conclusion of the report was, IT and the internet will solve everything. We will mm. have virtual communities and stuff. I when we don't live in a time where you burn people or you know, no. but publicly I say, this guy was an idiot. Now everybody mm. has said that now, but the fact that the government, including Mr. M the, uh, the minister from Boxtel, uh, uh, government um, uh, official, he acknowledged the report as, yeah, we should invest money in more internet to solve interracial, economic, uh, social problems, mm. more computers. I thought the guy is not mm. crazy, but he's dangerous. Yes. Yeah. That's and, and we come to the point where we have invested how many billions and billions and billions of dollars mm -hmm. into new economy. Mm -hmm. It's all a fraud. Yes, it yes. doesn't really yeah. work. Yeah. And we don't do anything about it. So the danger, as you say, of being involved in one kind of caste system and believing in it is dangerous. Yeah. We could have we could have solved a caste all system. The, yes. Well, I think believing in a caste system is dangerous. No, not a caste but system, but in that, in in the the the. the the specific things of the w of what you call the worker age, which is material mm. things. Well, what you're describing is very characteristic of uh, uh, both of the end of the worker age and the beginning of a spiritual age. Uh, at the end of the worker age, we definitely worship anything. We 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 make science and technology a god. Each That's age has its god. In the warrior age, conquest and empire are god. In the merchant age, money is god. In the worker age, science, technology, and head knowledge is god. In the spiritual age, God, is God, God is God. However, <laughs> however, in the beginning, in the beginning, there is this difficult period where we're entering a new age, but it's strongly influenced by the previous age. Mm, it's yeah, so this it's is, this combining is, with the previous age. It's the watershed and, time, right? And uh, it's hard to say whether what you're describing, which is going to happen to some extent, is the end of the last age or the beginning of the new age. It's both. However. I would say that the spiritual age begins religious but becomes more spiritual as it develops. And the distinction between religion and spirituality is important. When we think of it in English, uh, religion means something established, organized, an Linking. organized religion, uh, 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 rituals and customs connected with a religion that already exists when we're born. 
yeah. which we are born into. Uh, when we talk about spirituality, we think in a more general sense of getting in tune with oneself, listening uh, to the inner voice, God within, the mystical, uh, the mystical uh, n uh, be, uh, having a spiritual orientation that comes from inside you. This, of course, relates to the age model, which we didn't go into at all. Mm -hmm. But uh, I don't okay. know if we Listen, should, I don't no? think we have much time. We've spent right. more than an hour talking about your book, Sex, Age, and the Last Cast. Yes, right. yes and uh, I would say, and just taking a word from where we started, which is the caste system from the old Vedas, and it's the word Sangam. You know what it is? Sangam, there's a community of monks. Uh, no, a Sangam is a mixture. Oh, It's okay. where, uh, and it was a word that I um, saw a lot because Sangam is the place where the two rivers meet and mix. Ah, okay. But right. it's also used a crossroad. Right. Yeah, a, a right. Crossroads, so the crossing is the Sangam. Right. And it feels that what the people at the Kumbh Mela were doing, they were taking a dip in the Sangam where right. the um, Yamuna and Yamuna, the and Ganges. the uh, and the Ganges came together right. and exactly at a spot where it was a you could see the two kinds of waters mix. Yes. The holy place was there, the Sangam. Right. So you did Sangam, you go to the Sangam. There was a word that came there. Right. And it said that going and, and you know, accepting and diving into the mixture of things happening was the holy thing to do. Right. So what you're saying is we're going, we're in mixture times, in Sangam times, and uh, let's take a dip into it and see what comes out of it. And you say it. I wish I would have put it that way. <laughs> sangam times. Wel, daar zitten we dan weer. Op kleurnet hebben we gesproken met Larry Taub, Lawrence Taub. Het is Larry Taub, at... Uh, oh, uh, my, oké. Okay. Capital L, small A-R-R-Y, capital T, small A-U-B, dot tripod, T-R-I-P-O-D, dot C-O-M. I should mention... Oh, it, no, I think it's at tripod. No, there's no at for a website. That's oh, for oh, email. That's, yeah. that's for email. So yeah. you have Larry Taub dot tripod dot com and uh, that's where you find more information about sex age and the last cast yeah i think you have to put www oh yeah all that first, kind of stuff we'll put it sure. on thank you for being here and um dit was kleurnet luxala weer is pratend over uh, ik noem maar even sanger maar die vreemde mengeling van culturen invloeden historie verleden en toekomst zoals we wat vaker doen op kleurnet een blik op de wereld uh, Vanuit toch heel eenvoudig een studio op de single 459 in Amsterdam. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luke. Oké. Okay. En dat was Larry Taub. Over een minuut of... Uh, 15. Les in toveren. Helaas, Ludwig van Molier was deze week ziek, dus geen column over Suriname deze week. Daarom maar een portretje. En uh, natuurlijk aan het eind van de middag, daar is niks mis mee.